Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the introduction to sequences. For the most part, a sequence is simply an ordered list of numbers. While the idea is simple, there are a huge variety of uses for sequences. They come up in a wide variety of fields and they're an extremely important tool in advanced mathematics. In this lesson, we'll learn what a sequence is, various ways to describe them, and how to find patterns that they may be based on. Let's go. The definition of a sequence. A sequence in math means pretty much the same thing as it does in English. It is an order of things. Specifically in this case, it is an ordered list of numbers. We could write a sequence as a1, a2, a3, a4, dot dot dot, an, dot dot dot. So we call each of the entries in the sequence a term. So this would be a1, the first term, because it's the first in the sequence. A2 is the second term, because it's the second in the sequence. A3 would be the uh, third term, because it's the third in the sequence. So any symbol can be used to denote the sequence. In this case, we're just using the lowercase letter A, but we could use any letter, any symbol that we wanted. A is a common, convenient one, though. The subscript, that's the small number to the right, so here, this number, this little number 4, a subscript 4, a sub 4, tells us which term it is in the sequence. So this 4 here tells us that it is the fourth term in the sequence. Here are some examples. We could have 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 and the dot, dot, dot just says keep going in this manner. It continues on. 2, 9, 16, dot, 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 square root of x, square root of 2x, square root of 3x, dot, dot, dot. So a sequence is just some ordered list of things, ordered list of numbers in this case. So even here, it winds up being an ordered list of numbers. It's using a variable, but once we set x as some number, it's going to wind up just being an ordered list of numbers there as well. All right. If a sequence goes on forever without stopping, it's called an infinite sequence. Most of the sequences we're going to work with are infinite sequences. So that's something where it goes a1, a2, a3, a4, dot, 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 and then there's nothing after those dots. It just says it keeps going and there's no stop to this thing. On the other hand, we could have a finite sequence if the sequence does stop. So in that case, we have a1, a2, a3, a4, and there's that dot, dot, dot that says continue in this manner, but then we actually stop stop at AK. Notice how there's nothing after the AK, it's just blank after that. That says that we've reached the end point. There's not dot 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 to tell us keep going in this manner. We get to AK and we just stop at AK because there's nothing after AK, so it says this is the end of our sequence. We call the number of terms in a finite sequence its length. So in this case, in the length of the above sequence, we'd have k because we have a k here, we have a1 here, so that means we're counting our first term, our second term, our third term, all the way up until our kth term. So 1 up until k, right, if we count from 1 to k, whatever k is, that means we're going to have a total of k things, so we have a length of k for that finite sequence. We can often talk about some formula that allows us to find the nth term, also called the general term. If we know such a formula, we can easily find any term. By plugging in different values for n, since we know what the nth term is going to be, well, if we say some value for n, we can find the term that is that value, right? If we plug in n equals 3, we can find the third locations. So as long as we know, assuming we know a n equals some stuff, right, some algebraic formulation, then if we set n equal to 1, we would get the first term a1. If we set n equal to 17, we'd get the 17th term, a17. Notice how the n equals 17 replaces the where the n would have been, right? It's a subscript n, but since we swapped it out for 17, we now have a subscript 17. So because we've got some algebraic formulation for the way a n works, for the way this nth term works, the way this general term works, we can plug in our value for n, use this algebraic formulation, and churn out some number to know what a for any term is going to be. For example, if we know a n equals 7 n minus 5, then we've got the sequence a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. Well, notice here in a 1, that means n equals 1. So we swap out the n in 7 n minus 5 for 7 times 1 minus 5. 
7 minus 5 gets us 2, so we now know that a1 is equal to 2. Same thing for a2, we know that at a2 we've got n equal to 2, so we swap out 7n minus 5 to 7 times 2 minus 5, 7 times 2, 14, 14 minus 5, 9. So now we have that the second entry in our sequence, the second term in our sequence is 9. A3, we've got n equals 3, so we swap out, we've got 7 times 3 minus 5, 21 minus 5, 16. So our third entry, A3, is equal to 16. At A4, we have n equals 4, 7 times 4 minus 5, 7 times 4, 28, 28 minus 5, and so we've got 23 for our fourth term as well. So by knowing the general term, by knowing this general term, a n equals 7 n minus 5, we're able to find any term. So we can find any term if we know this general form a n equals some algebraic format, right? Like 7 times n minus 5. We can also define a sequence based on terms that came previously. So we just figured out a way to just say the absolute thing is going to be this. This will be this based on this formula, right? We've got this definite general term. But we can also define it based on terms that came previously. This is called defining a sequence recursively. In this, the sequence is built on a recursion formula that shows how each term is based on preceding terms. Recursive, we're looking backwards to something that came previously. For example, if we have the recursion formula a n equals a n minus 1 plus 7, then what's that saying is that the nth term, well that's a n right here, is created by looking at the previous term. Well, what would be 1 before n? n minus 1. So a sub n minus 1 is going to be the term just before the nth term. So a n minus 1, and then adding 7 to it, that plus 7 business right there. So a n equals a n minus 1 plus 7. Some term is equal to the previous term plus 7. Since this is true for any n at all, the recursion formula tells us that every term is equal to the term before it plus 7, right? We didn't say n has to be some specific value. We haven't nailed down what the value of it's going to be. So since this is true for any n, the recursion formula tells us every term, because it's true for any n, so a n equals a n minus 1 plus 7 for any value of n, every term will be equal to the term before plus 7. However, there is one special term that doesn't have a term before it, right? Our recursion formula was based on look at the guy behind you and add 7. But in this case, there is one number that isn't going to have a guy behind it. The person who's the first in the line, right? Not really a person, a number. But whatever term is first, our first term, there's nothing behind it. There's nothing to look at behind that term. So if that's the case, we need something to start from. A recursion formula on its own is not enough to obtain a sequence. We need some sort of starting place before we can make a sequence. We need to know what is that first term? What is that seed that our recursion formula will grow off of? This is called the initial term or terms if we need multiple of them. So using the initial term a1 equals 2 with the previous recursion formula a n equals a n minus 1 plus 7, then our first term is going to be a1 right here. Well, we were just told a1 equals 2, so that means we have 2 here. Then from there on out, we have a n equals a n minus plus a n minus 1 plus 7. So that says take to get a term, you take the previous term and you add 7. So to get from 2 to the next term, we get plus 7. So 2 plus 7 gets us 9. To get to the next one, we have plus 7. So that gets us 16. To get to the next term, we have plus 7. That gets us 23. Writing out exactly what happens, if we want to know what a2 is going to be equal to, right? a2 is this guy right here. Then a2 is equal to a2 minus 1, or 1, plus 7. So a1 is equal to 2, we figured that out here, then plus 7, so we get a2 equals 9, which is what we got right here. And the same thing's going on for figuring out a3. a3 is going to be equal to a2 plus 7. a4 is going to be equal to a3 plus 7, because our recursion formula is telling us to go that way. Given a recursion formula and initial terms, it can be possible to find a formula for the nth term, so that absolute 
plug in a number for our n using the general term, it just spits out what the value is. There are sometimes ways to be able to do this. If you have a recursion formula, you can sometimes tran recursion formula and initial terms, you can sometimes transform it into a formula for the nth term. Similarly, it can be possible to transform an nth term formula into a recursion formula and initial terms. So if we know the general term, we can go to recursion formula. If we go to the recursion formula, we can go to the general form. However, we can't always wind up doing this. There's no guarantee that we can do this. We very often can, especially at this level in math, but sometimes it's not going to be so easy to do. Sometimes it's going to be really hard. So sometimes it'll be totally easy, but sometimes it's going to be hard and sometimes it's going to be impossible. It will, be de it will depend on the specific sequence we're working with. Some sequences are really easy to talk about in a recursion formula, but basically impossible to talk about as a general term, a nth term format. Other ones are really easy to talk about in that nth term format, that general term, but really hard, practically impossible to talk about in a recursion formula. So we won't necessarily be able to switch between the two, but we will often be able to switch between the two. And if a problem ever asks us to switch between the two, it will certainly be possible. Very, very often you'll be given the first few terms of a sequence and told to either give more terms or figure out a formula for the nth term. To do this, you'll have to figure out some pattern in the sequence and then exploit it. You'll have to look at the pattern, look at the sequence and go, how are these things connected? What is a pattern in here that I can use to create a formula? However, before we learn how to do this, how before we learn how to find patterns and sequences, I want to point out that there is technically no guarantee a sequence must have a pattern. There is no guarantee that we will have patterns in our sequences. For example, the below is a perfectly legitimate sequence with no pattern we're going to be able to find in it. 47, then negative 3, then 0 0.0012, then pi raised to the negative fifth power, then 17, then 1, then 1 again, then 800, and then a whole bunch of other numbers. There's no like pattern here going on. There's no rhyme, there's no reason. There's nothing we're gonna be able to figure out to create some formula here. So there's no guarantee a sequence has to have some pattern that we're going to be able to create a formula from. Things can be really confusing with sequences and we won't be able to figure out a way to generate a formula. But good news, all the sequences at this level in math will have patterns. So technically a sequence is not required to have a pattern, but at this level in math, all the sequences we see are definitely going to have patterns. We will always be able to find patterns in the sequences we're working with. So we don't have to worry about problems being unsolvable because we can always rely that there's going to be some pattern in there somewhere. There will always be a pattern that we can find if we look hard enough. If the problem is about finding patterns, there's definitely going to be a pattern for us to find. We just have to look carefully and, you know, be really creative. It won't necessarily be easy to find the pattern, but it will be in there somewhere. It's not going to be something like this where it's, you know, really, really hard for us to be able to see a pattern because there's simply no pattern. There's going to be cases in all the things we're looking at, it's always going to be the case that we're going to be able to find a pattern somehow. We don't have to worry about the stuff where there's just no pattern whatsoever. So all the problems we'll be asked to do, we'll be able to do. To find more terms in a sequence or figure out a formula for the nth term, the first thing we have to do is identify a pattern in the sequence. If we want to find a formula, if we want to be able to talk about more terms, the first thing we have to go figure out is what goes on in the sequence. How does the sequence work? So consider these two sequences, 17, 12, 7, 2, and 2, 6, 18, 54, continuing on with both of them. So let's look at the first one, 17, 12, 7, 2. So what we can do is we can say, well, what's the connection here between 17 and 12, and how's that related to 12 to 7, and how's that related to 7 to 2? Well, looking at this for a little while, we probably realize, oh, what we're doing to get from 17 to 12 is we're subtracting by 5. What we're doing to get from 12 to 7 is we're subtracting to 5. What we're doing to get from 7 to 2 is we're subtracting by 5. So we know this pattern of subtract by 5, subtract by 5, subtract by 5. It's going to continue on because it showed up everywhere in the sequence so far. Similarly over here, how do we get from 2 to 6, from 6 to 18, from 18 to 54? Looking at it for a while, we probably realize, oh, what we're doing is we're multiplying by 3, right? 2 times 3 gets us 6. 6 times 3 gets us 18. 18 times 3 gets us 54. So this pattern will continue on throughout the rest of the sequence because it showed up in all the sequence that we saw. We've figured out what the patterns are. 
we notice that the sequence on the left subtracts by 5 every term, the one on the right multiplies by 3. At this point, it would be easy to find more terms, right? If we wanted to find the next term in the sequence 17, 12, 7, 2, we'd just subtract by 5 again, so 2 minus 5 would get us negative 3, and we'd be able to keep going if we wanted to. Similarly, over here, if we wanted to figure out the next pattern in two, the next term in 2, 6, 18, 54, we just have to multiply by 3 again. So what would come after that? 54 times 3. 150 plus 4 times 3, 12, so 162. So we get 162 is the next one, and we'd be able to continue on in that, that manner if we wanted to find any more terms in the sequence. So it's easy to find more terms, and it'd also be easy to find a recursion formula, right? The one, our red one that we're doing, the minus 5 one, that's just going to be a n minus 1 minus 5. And the green one, the second one with multiplication times 3, that would be a n minus 1 times 3. So it wouldn't be very hard to figure out recursion formulas because they're really deeply connected to the pattern we saw. However, if we want a formula for the nth term, it's going to take a little more thought because we have to be able to figure out how does this work for all of them, right? It's not just describing the pattern of how do we get from one to the next or how do we get from this one to the next one. It's describing how do we get to any of them without being able to have any sort of reference points. We can't just say minus five, minus five, minus five. We have to figure out a way of collecting all of the minus fives that happened or all of the times threes that happened. So we think about it for a while and we'll be able to figure this out. So we'd be able to get a n equals 20 2 minus 5n. You'll be able to realize that since what we're doing is we're subtracting by 5 a bunch of times, it's going to be minus 5 times n, and then we need to figure out what number are we subtracting 5, and we want to make sure to check the first few terms. Always check the first few terms once you think you figured out a formula for the general term. Once you think you know what the nth term is going to be, make sure you check that what you figured out is right, because it's easy to make a mistake and be off by a little bit, to be off by one number in the sequence. So just make sure you try and check. So for example, if we figured out what is a1 going to be, well, that'd be 22 minus 5 times 1, 22 minus 5 times 1, 22 minus 5, or 17. Hey, that checks out with what we have here. If we did a2, then that'd be equal to 22 minus 5 times 2, 22 minus 5 times 2, 22 minus 10, 22 minus 10, 12. Hey, that checks out with what we have here, so it looks like it winds up working out. Similarly, for the green one or multiplication one, a n equals 2 times 3 to the n minus 1. Well, let's think about this. Does this wind up working out? We realize that it has to be something about 3 to the sum exponent because every time, every step, Right? We are multiplying by some 3, so if we stack all of those 3s together, it's going to be 3 to the sum exponent, to some sort of exponent. The question is, what should that exponent be? 3 to the n minus 1, because this very first one hasn't been affected by the 3 at all. So let's check and make sure that's the case. If we plug in a1 equals 2 times 3 to the 1 minus 1, then that would be 2 times 3 to the 0. 3 to the 0 is just 1, right? Any number raised to the 0 is just 1, so we get 2. 2 checks out. If we did a2, then we'd have a2 is 2 times 3 to the 2 minus 1 or to the 1, so equals 6. That checks out. And we can see that this is going to continue to work, so our general formula works out. But make sure you check it and you think about it. It can be a little bit difficult, but as long as you check it, you can be sure that what you got is going to work. When trying to recognize a pattern in a sequence, try to think in terms of how to get from one term to the next. How do you get from this first term to the next term? How do you get from the first term to the second term? So establish a hypothesis, establish some guess at what you think the pattern is by looking at a1 to a2. So you want to start off with a hypothesis. You think this is probably how the pattern works. You look at a1 to a2, and then you want to test that hypothesis against the following ones, a2 to a3, a3 to a4, any other terms that are given. So you come up with, I think the pattern here, the way we get from one stepping stone to the next stepping stone is we do some operation. Add by some number, multiply by some number, it's doing some sort of thing, how is it working out? So figure out what you think is going on for the way the pattern works, and then test and make sure, yeah, that works on the way that we get to the next one, the way we get to the next one, or that it just works for the nth number location. So once you have some hypothesis, test it against all the other ones, if it works, Great, you know, you just figured out the pattern, now you're ready to figure out some way to formulate that general form, that general term, the nth term. If it doesn't work, right, if it doesn't work, back to the drawing board. Figure out a new hypothesis, figure out some new hypothesis, and then try again. It's all about figure out something that you think might work and then test it against the information you have. Keep testing until you get something that actually winds up working out, at which point you found the pattern, now you're ready to start working your way towards a general term formula.
Once you figure out the pattern, it's easy to find further terms in the sequence, right? That's the easiest part. You just plug in, you just continue with that pattern to generate any more terms that they tell you to generate. Finding a formula for the nth term, that can be tricky. So a formula for the nth term can be a little bit tricky. So what you want to do is you want to think carefully about how you can put the pattern into an equation, then make sure to check some terms after you create the formula. That checking is really, really important. So think carefully about how you can put that pattern into an equation, and then check after you've come up with some sort of equation that you think will probably work. It's really important to check because it's really easy to make mistakes, especially the first couple times you're doing it. We'll also see this a whole bunch of times in the examples. We're going to work with this a whole bunch of examples here. So that will really help cement our understanding of how to do this. We've got lots of examples to make this clear. All right. So how do we find patterns? That can sometimes be a tricky thing. When trying to find the pattern in a sequence, the two most common pattern types that appear are addition subtraction, where we just add by some k every term. So k could be a positive number, k could be a negative number. That allows us to add or subtract depending on what the k is. But we're just adding by the same k. We're just adding by some constant number every time we do a step. And then the other one is multiplication division, where we multiply by some k every term. So if it's multiplication, it's just some constant number k. And we can also effectively divide by if it's you know a fraction as our k, we're effectively doing division there as well. So we're just multiplying by some constant number every term, right? Every step, it's either going to be addition or multiplication. These are this is the lion's share of the patterns. Many, many of the patterns that we're going to work with at this level, and really at any level, are going to be connected to addition, subtraction, or multiplication and division. So these are the first two that you want to keep in your head. A large number of patterns can be figured out just by keeping these two types in mind. So always think first in terms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Check to see if you see those first. However, those aren't the only kinds of patterns that you wind up seeing. So these two pattern types are not enough to figure out the pattern for all sequences. In that case, it can help to keep various other patterns in mind. A good one to keep in mind is the squares, n squared. So 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, 7 squared. But often you won't see them as number squared because then it'd be really easy to recognize the pattern. So instead you see it as 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, and continuing on if they still have even more terms. So it just helps to keep that structure of numbers in the back of your head. It's really useful to be able to remember what are all those perfect squares, what are all those squares that you're used to working with that you've seen you know, in previous algebra classes. Just keep them in your mind and look for things that look somewhat like that or along those lines. Another one that often shows up is cubes. This one's less often than squares, but it does show up. So n cubed, 1 cubed, 2 cubed, 3 cubed, 4 cubed, 5 cubed, 6 cubed, etc. Once again, you very often won't see it as number cubed, because then it'd be easy to see that the pattern is cubes. And it's supposed to be a little more challenging than that. So instead, it's normally 1, and then 8, and then 27, then 64, then 125, then 216, and so on and so on. So you're probably less used to using cubes, so it's really important just pay attention to at least these first four. Memorize 1, 8, 27, then maybe 64, maybe 125. Keep at least those first few terms in mind because you want to be prepared to go, well, I'm not used to seeing this pattern. I'm not used to seeing something like this. But oh, maybe it's cubes because I see that the first three are like that. And then you can check the other ones by hand and make sure that that does work out. You don't have to memorize the whole thing, but you do have to be ready to, when you see the pattern, to be able to think maybe that's going to be something. You have to be prepared to recognize. You don't have to know the whole pattern, but you have to be prepared to recognize it. Finally, factorials, n factorial. 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial, 6 factorial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once again, you aren't normally going to see that as factorials written out. You'll instead often see it as something like 1, then 2, then 6, 24, 120, 720. So a really good one to memorize is 1, 2, 6, 24, 120. That's 1 factorial, then 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial. So if you can keep that pattern in your head, just keep that one in the back of your head, because that will wind up showing up a lot. And if you're not prepared to recognize that pattern, that kind of problem will be really, really hard because you won't be able to see that pattern when it shows up. And in case you forgot how a factorial works, factorials multiply every number uh, sorry, the number that it is factorial by every integer below the number. So for example, 5 factorial would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which works out to 120. And we define, we just specifically define 0 factorial equals 1 for ease. It helps things out work. It helps a lot of other things in math work out. So 0 factorial equals 1, we just set it that way. Try not to think about, try not to get worried about that doesn't make sense compared to how the other one works out. 
it actually sort of makes sense, but it's better to just remember and memorize zero factorial equals one. That one will come up occasionally. All right. Sometimes the sign will change with each term. It'll flip-flop between positive and negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, right? You'll have, say, a positive on one, and then the next one will be negative, and the next one will be positive, and the next one will be negative, and the next one will be positive, and the negative, and so on and so forth. And you'll see this flip-flopping pattern. If that's the case, it might be one of these two following, one of these two uh, methods, these two types of patterns. Negative one raised to the n plus one. So notice that if we have n at one, then we'll have negative one squared, which is going to come out to be a positive of one. Then the next one would be negative one to the two plus one, n equals two, so negative one to the three, so that's going to wind up being negative one. And then we get positive one and negative one and positive one and negative one, because negative one raised to some integer is just going to multiply by negative one that many times, so it will flip-flop between positive, negative, positive, negative as our n step up one at a time. Similarly, negative one raised to the n gives us the exact same pattern of flip-flop, flip-flop. It just starts, instead of starting at positive one, it'll start at negative one, and then it'll be positive one, then negative one, then positive positive one, then negative one, then positive one. So if you see flip -flopping, uh, a flip-flopping sign pattern, you don't see something else to be able to cause that to happen in, your, uh, in the sequence that you're working with, whatever pattern you're working with, these two guys right here are a really good thing to keep in the back of your mind for a way to just cause a flip-flopping sign to appear. If most of the terms in a sequence are presented in a certain format, for example, they're all in fractions, try to figure out a way to put all the terms in that format. So if you see a certain format in your sequence, put all the terms into that format. So if most of your terms are in fractions, make all of your terms in fractions. It can be a lot easier to see patterns if everything is in the same format. So if you get all of your sequence terms in the same format, it normally causes patterns to sort of appear more readily. Furthermore, if the format can clearly be broken into multiple parts, for example, if we have a fraction, blank over blank, we can break it into the numerator, right, the part on top, and the denominator, the part on the bottom. So in that case, we can clearly talk about all of our numerators behave by some pattern, all of our denominators behave by some pattern. So if you can break the thing into multiple parts. So if a format can be broken into multiple parts, like for example, fraction is numerator over denominator every single time, it can help to figure out patterns for each part separately. So figure out the numerator pattern on its own, figure out the denominator pattern on its own. Sometimes that will really help clarify things. You don't have to worry about trying to figure out the whole fraction. You can instead break it apart piecemeal and then just put them back together once you recognize each pattern on its own. It's important to note that these pattern types, all these different pattern types we've talked about so far, they don't necessarily occur in isolation. They do not necessarily occur in isolation. Well, that will sometimes happen. You will sometimes just have addition. You will sometimes just have multiplication. You will sometimes just have flip-flopping signs. But we're often going to wind up working with sequences that use multiple pattern types at once. So it will be up to us to figure out, oh, okay, it's using this pattern and this pattern and this pattern, and then figure out some way to sort of merge all those three patterns together once we're trying to describe the whole thing. They might even wind up involving patterns that you haven't seen before. They might do something where you don't immediately recognize, where you have to come up a new way to describe it. So keep a lookout for something that looks weird, that's totally new to the way that you're doing stuff, and you might wind up having to learn a new method of describing things, which will just take longer to think through. It can sometimes help to write the number of the term above or below each term. So to write n equals 1, and then n equals 2, and so on and so forth. So by writing the number of the term above or below, you're able to keep track of numerical location by being able to see what number are we at. Are we at the first term? Are we at the fifth term? By being able to have this clear reference point of this is term number one, this is term number five, you'll be able to see how does the number of the term relate to the values inside of the actual term inside of the sequence, the values of that term. So the location of the term will normally be related to the values inside of the term. That will often make it easier to identify patterns by being able to see this has number location 5, and because of that we see that the general form is working in this certain way. So writing the numbers above or below can really help you see that sort of stuff. In the end, there's no one way to identify all patterns. I want you to try to take a broad view of the sequence and look for repetitions or similarities to other patterns you've seen. 
don't try to focus on it always being the same thing because it won't. Each sequence is probably going to have its own special pattern. You'll start getting used to certain ways that patterns interact or certain types of patterns and it'll be easier to recognize them on future ones. And a lot of this, show, a lot of this stuff will show up in a whole bunch of different places like standardized tests, later in different math classes, in science classes. So what you're learning in this class will definitely be applicable for a long time to come. But it's not necessarily always going to be the same thing. So just take a broad view of what's going on. Don't think it's definitely going to work in one way because you don't really know until you figured out what the pattern is. So look at the thing carefully. Think, eh, how are these numbers, how does one term interact with the next term? How are these two terms related to each other? Is there some sort of general pattern that's occurring as I look through all of the numbers at once? all of my terms at once. Try to think in really large, broad strokes before you try to come up with very specific patterns showing up. And if you still can't figure it out, if you're looking at it for a long time, you can't figure it out, see if there's an alternative way to write the terms out. That was what I was talking about with like, if most of them are in fractions, put all of them in fractions. Figure if there's some way to write the terms in something so that they all have this new alternative way because maybe that'll help you see what's going on better. And just in general, persevere, be creative. Figuring out patterns is not something where it's just a step, 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 step method got to the answer. It's something where you have to look at it and sort of think for a while, and just be clever, have a little bit of luck, and just work at it. So if you really can't figure it out for a long time, go to the next problem and come back to that problem later. Sometimes just a little bit of time will cause it to you know, bounce around in your head and you'll be able to see the pattern easily when earlier it was really, really difficult. So just stick with it, and as you work with it more and more, it'll make more and more sense. All right, we're ready for some examples. Given the nth term, write the first four terms, four terms of each sequence and assume each sequence starts at n equals 1. So that nth term, that general term, is a n equals stuff, right? So in this case, for our first one, we've got a n equals 3n minus 2. So our first term, the a1, is going to be when n equals 1, right? So we plug in a1 equals 3 times 1 minus 2. Similarly, a2 is when n equals 2, so we've got a2 equals 3 times 2 minus 2, a3 equals 3 times 3 minus 2, a4 equals, write that a little bit below, lost not quite enough room, 3 times 4 minus 2. So we work this out, a1 equals 3 times 1 minus 2, 3 minus 2, so we get a1 equals 1. a2, 3 times 2, 6, 6 minus 2, 4. a3 equals 3 times 3, 9 minus 2, 9 minus 2, 7. a4 equals 3 times 4, 12 minus 2, 10. So we've got the first four terms here, a1 equals 1, a2 equals 4, a3 equals 7, a4 equals 10. Also, I want to point out, notice how a1 to get to a2, we added by 3. To get to a3, we added by 3. To get to a4, we added by 3. Each term here has this plus 3 step, which we're going to wind up seeing from this 3 times n, because the 3 times n, the n is what term location we're at, so as we go up more term locations, we're going to wind up seeing more times that we've wound up adding on this 3n to the thing adding on uh, the number 3. All right, next one, bn equals negative 1 to the n over n plus 3. Our first one, a1, is going to be negative 1 to the 1 over 1 plus 3, right? We swap out all the n's that occur for whatever we've got here, a1. Next, a2 equals negative 1 squared, negative 1 to the 2, divided by 2 plus 3. A3 is equal to negative 1 to the 3 over 3 plus 3. A4 is going to be equal to negative 1 to the 4 over 4 plus 3. Oh, we can work this out here. We've got A1 equals negative 1 to the 1, still just negative 1, 1 plus 3, 4, so we've got negative 1 over 4. A2, negative 1 squared, negative 1 times negative 1, that cancels to just positive. So we've just got a positive 1 divided by 2 plus 3, 5. A3 equals negative 1 cubed, negative 1 to an odd exponent, going to wind up leaving a negative after. So we've got negative 1 over 3 plus 3, 6. A4 equals negative 1 to the fourth to an even exponent. It's going to cancel out. We're going to have a positive. So we've got 1 over 4 plus 3, 7. So a1 equals negative 1 fourth, a2 equals positive 1 fifth, a3 equals negative 1 sixth, a4 equals 1 over 7. We found the first four terms. Finally, 
cn equals 47. Oh, whoops. That whole time shouldn't have been an because it was bn. So it actually should have been not a2, not a1, any of these. It should have been b1, b2, b3, b4 because it has a different name than the sequence at the top. That's why we're using a different letter because it is a different sequence for this problem. b1, b2, b3, b4. So it's easy to wind up forgetting that we're changing symbols sometimes, so pay attention to the symbol of the sequence that you're working with. All right, last one, cn equals 47. Thing to notice here is, does this side, does the right side wind up involving n at all? It doesn't. As the n changes, the right side doesn't notice the n change. So c1 is going to be equal to 47. c2 is going to be equal to 47. c3 is going to be equal to 47. c4 is going to be equal to 47. So whatever value we wind up using for n, it's always going to wind up coming out to 47. So first term 47, second term 47, third term 47, fourth term 47, we always wind up getting 47 because it's just a constant sequence. All right. Second example, the Fibonacci sequence is a well-known recursively defined sequence. It's given by the recursion formula and the initial terms below write out the first 12 terms. So its recursion formula is a n equals a n minus 1 plus a n minus 2 and a 1 is equal to a 2 which equals 1. So right off the bat we know our first two terms are 1, right, a 1 equals 1, comma, and then a 2 also equals 1, so 1, comma, 1. If we want to figure out the next term, well, we've got a n equals a n minus 1 plus a n minus 2. So if we want to figure out what is a 3 going to be, then that's going to be equal to a 3 minus 1, so a 2, plus a 3 minus 2, a 1. a 3, we don't know what a 3 is, but we do know what a 1 and a 2 are. They're both 1, so we've got 1 plus 1, a 3 equals 2. So our next term is 2. What comes after that? If we want to figure out a 4, that would be a 4 minus 1, a 3, plus a 4 minus 2, a 2. What is a 3? We just figured out a 3 equals 2, so we've got 2 plus a 2, once again, 1, equals 3. a 4 equals 3, so the next thing is going to be a 3. Let's do one more of these, and then we'll see what is see what the general pattern here going on is. A5 is equal to, not the general term, but how is this pattern working on the whole? A5 is equal to A4, the previous term, plus the term previous to that one, A3. So A5 equals A4 plus A3. We just figured out A4 equals 3, and A3 equals 2. So we've got A5 equals 5. So there's our next term, 5. What comes after that? So how do we get this? Well, notice a5 equals a4 plus a3. So a5 is equal to the previous term plus the term previous to that. a4 equals a3 plus a2. a4 is equal to the previous term plus the term previous to that. a3 equals a2 plus a1. So the previous term plus the term previous to that. So what we're doing to make the next term, it's look at the previous term and the previous previous term. So to make whatever comes after the 5, it's going to be add 3 and 5 together, and that will make the next thing. So 3 plus 5 gets us 8. Then the next one is going to once again be take the 5 and the 8, add them together. So 5 plus 8 gets us 13. We see that this relationship here is any term is equal to the previous term and the ter previous previous term added together. So that's why we needed a1 and a2 because we needed two terms so that we could talk in terms of previous previous term. We needed that larger start. We needed two initial terms before we'd be able to get the ball rolling. So at this point we just add things together. 8 plus 13, 21. 21 plus 13, 34. 21 plus 34, 55, 34 plus 55, 89, 55 plus 89, 144, and it will continue on in this matter. And there we are. There's the Fibonacci sequence. There are the first 12 terms of the, terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Cool. Fibonacci sequence has some other interesting properties. You might wind up studying it more in the class that you're currently in or in a future class. It's a pretty cool thing, but it's enough for us now just to understand how the thing works out. All right. 
Third example, find the nth term for each sequence below and assume that the sequence starts at n equals 1. So the first thing we always have to do if we're looking at a sequence and we want to figure out what is the nth term, the a n, the general term, some general term equals some formulaic algebra expression, then it's going to be we have to figure out the pattern, and then we use that pattern to come up with an equation. So what's the pattern in this first sequence? Negative 3, 1, 5, 9, 13. Well, notice how do we get from negative 3 to 1? We can just add 4. How do we get from 1 to 5? Hey, we add 4 again. Looks like our pattern probably is going to work out. 5 to 9, hey, we add 4. 9 to 13, hey, we add 4. 13 to whatever's next, it's probably going to be add 4, add 4, add 4. Since the pattern worked for everything that we've seen so far in the sequence, we can assume that the pattern is definitely just add 4. So if that's going to be the case, we know it's got to be something of the form a n equals 4 times n plus don't know yet. We don't know what's going to be, so we'll just leave that as a question mark. We could also use a variable like normal, but in this case, the variable I've decided to use is question mark. A n equals 4 times n. That represents this step, 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 plus 4, plus 4, plus 4, plus 4, right? Every step brings plus 4. Every term we move on to brings this adding by 4. And so 4 times n will allow us to represent how many sort of steps we've taken, multiply by 4, and that brings that many 4s to the table. So now we just need to figure out what's the question mark. Well, notice we know a1 equals negative 3. So that means we can have a1 equals 4 times 1 plus question mark. So we know a1 equals negative 3, so negative 3 equals 4, 4 times 1 is just 4, plus question mark. So we have negative 7, solving for question mark, negative 7 equals question mark. So at this point, plugging that in, we have that a n, the general term, is equal to 4 n minus 7. Always a good idea to check this sort of thing out, so that probably will wind up working out, but let's make sure. So we already checked A1, that's how we figured it out, so let's check and make sure that A2 winds up working out. A2 equals 4 times 2 minus 7, so 8 minus 7, which equals 1, and that checks out. Next up, A3 equals 4 times 3 minus 7 equals 12 minus 7 equals 5, and that checks out. And we can see going along this method that this is going to wind up working because we've got this 4n here. So every time we go forward another term, we're going to wind up adding another 4, which also represents our pattern of plus 4 each time. So makes sense. We've got our answer. The general term for that sequence is a n equals 4n minus 7. All right, next one. 2, 5, 10, 17, 26. So first thing we want to do, we want to figure out what the pattern is. So if it's addition, then we'd have something like plus 3. All right, to get from 2 to 5, it's plus 3. To get from 5 to 10, it's plus 5. To get from 10 to 17, it's plus 17. That's not going to wind up working out, right? It can't be addition as our pattern. We see that pretty quickly. So let's try another really common one is multiplying. Well, to get from 2 to 5, we have to multiply by 5 over 2. To get from 5 to 10, we multiply by 2. Yeah, that's not going to work. We see very quickly that multiplication, multiplication is just not friendly here. It's not going to work out in a very good way. So multiplication is right out. So at that point, we see that addition fails. Multiplication fails. So now this is where we really go to the drawing board and we start thinking, hmm, what is going to be able to get us the answer here? What winds up, what's going on here? What is the pattern 2, 5, 10, 17, 26? And this is the part where we sort of lean back and we just think for a while. We think, what does this look like? What have I seen that looks even vaguely similar to the way this grows, the fifth term, 20, how does, what does this work? We might try coming up with some pattern the first time, doesn't wind up working. That's okay. The important thing is just keep looking at it and go, keep going, scratching your head and thinking, how is this related to something else? So remember we talked about some of the other patterns that are likely to show up, squares, cubes, factorial. So those are a good one to start trying out if you can't figure it out yet. So let's look at squares. What are the squares? Well, the squares would wind up going, if we had simply n squared, then that would wind up giving us the sequence 1, 1 squared is 1, then 2 squared is 4, then 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25. Hmm. How does 1, 4, 9, 16, 25 relate to 2, 5, 10, 17, 26? Oh, they're very similar. We're just adding by 1, right? If we add by 1, so plus 1 would get us 2. Plus 1 would get us 5. Plus 1 would get us 10. 
plus 1 would get a 17, plus 1 would get a 26. So we've figured out what is the general term here. What is the nth term? It's the formula a n equals n squared, right? Because it's the number squared, but then we also have to add 1. a n equals n squared plus 1. That seems to give us the formula for our general term for this sequence. Let's check and make sure that that is indeed the case. We do a quick check. So if we plug in a1 equals 1 squared plus 1, then we get 1 plus 1, which equals 2. Hey, that checks out. If we plug in for our second term, a2, then we'd have 2 squared plus 1. 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. Hey, that checks out. Our next one, a3 equals 3 squared plus 1. 9 plus 1 equals 10. Hey, that checks out. Great. So at this point, it seems our n squared plus 1, that winds up working out. It winds up following this sort of like the squares method, but a little bit more, just adding one each time. We see that the pattern we figured out winds up being the same. So notice this pattern isn't really so much a pattern about a recursive thing going on, right? It's not really so much about adding a different number each time, multiplying by, adding the same number each time, multiplying by some number each time. We could figure it out as a recursion formula, but it's easier to think of it in just in terms of this absolute, here's the general term, here's how any given location winds up working. It's the number of the location squared plus one. All right, fourth example, given the recursion relationship below, write the first five terms, then give the nth term. So we've got a n equals negative 3 times a n minus 1. So that's to say some term is equal to negative 3 times the previous term, right? a n is some term, a n minus 1 is term 1 back, right? Going backwards by 1, so negative 3 times the previous term. And we have to have some starting place to begin with, otherwise we won't be able to always look at previous terms. So we start at 2. Then the next one, if we want to talk about a2, the second term, it would be negative 3 times a1. So a2 is equal to negative 3 times a1 is just 2. So times 2 equals negative 6. So a2 equals negative 6. So notice all we really did there was it was just multiply by negative 3. So we can probably just wind up doing this in our head. So 2, then negative 6. What would come after that? 2, then negative 6, then we multiply by negative 3 again, right? Negative 3 times the previous term to get our next term. So negative 6 times negative 3 gets us positive 18. To get the next term, 18 times negative 3, that's going to wind up being 54, negative 54, because it's negative 3. Next term is going to wind up being times another negative 3, positive 162. And it will continue on in this matter. So we've now figured out the first five terms. Great. But we also have to give the nth terms. So how can we figure out what the nth term is? Let's switch colors for this. So nth term. So notice 2, negative 6, 18, negative 54, 162. Kind of hard to see a pattern there, really obviously. We see that every time it's multiplying by negative 3 because we were told very explicitly the recursion formula says multiply by negative 3. So maybe we could make that negative 3 show up so we could see that a little more easily. So if we do that, we could write it's 2 first, right? We have 2 shows up at the beginning. It doesn't have any negative 3s multiplying it by it yet. But next is going to be negative 3 to the 1 times, well, we wouldn't be able to figure out immediately that it's going to be to the 1. So negative 3 times 2. Then the next one would be negative 3 times it again. So now we've got negative 3 squared times 2. Then the next one would be negative 3 cubed times 2. Then the next one would be negative 3 to the 4th times 2. And it would just continue on in this manner. So remember, we want to get the whole thing to look like a similar format. So everybody's got these negative 3s on them raised to the sum exponent for the most part, right? Most of them have the exponents, and all of them wind up having the negative 3 business here, with the exception of this guy who neither has exponents or negative 3. So we want to get them to all have this similar format. So we've got negative 3 to the what? What can number can we multiply by? What can we always multiply? We can always multiply by negative 3 to the 0th. So negative 3 to the 0th times 2 because that's just 1. Over here we've got negative 3 to the 1 times 2, negative 3 to the 2 times 2, negative 3 to the 3 times 2, negative 3 to the 4 times 2, and so on. So if that's the case, we can match this up to n equals 1 is here, n equals 2 is here, n equals 3 is here, n equals 4 is here, n equals 5 is here. So what changes each time? The only thing that winds up changing, 0, 1, 2, 
three, four, everything else is the same. So n equals one gets us zero. n equals two gets us one. So what are we doing to the n? We're subtracting by one each time. So we see that the general term can be given as a n equals negative three raised to the n minus one times two. And there we go. If we want to check that, let's check just for the third term, heck just randomly to make sure everything winds up working out. So the third term, a3, is equal to negative 3 raised to the 3 minus 1 times 2. So that's negative 3. 3 minus 1 is squared times 2. Negative 3 squared equals 9 times 2. 9 times 2 is 18. And that checks out with what we already figured out is the third term. Great. So we figured out our general term, our nth term formula works out perfectly. Fifth example, find the nth term for the sequence below. Assume that the sequence starts at n equals 1. So first thing, most of it winds up being in this fraction, 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 not a fraction, right? So we want to get everybody in terms of these fractions. So let's get everybody in fraction format. So 1 plus 2 over 1 is how we'll replace that. And then 2 plus 3 over 2, right? And so on and so on. The rest of them are now in fraction. So we can write this, uh, here's our n equals 1, here's our n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 6. So notice, everybody winds up changing. All of the numbers in each of these terms winds up being different than the previous and the, pat the next term. But we wind up seeing some connections here, right? 1 matches to the 1's here. 2 matches to the 2's here. 3 matches to the 3's here. 4 matches to the 4's here, 5 matches to the 5's here, 6 matches to the 6's here, and we see that this other number is just plus 1 each time, right? 1 plus 1 gets us 2, 2 plus 1 gets us 3, 3 plus 1, 4, 4 plus 1, 5, 5 plus 1, 6, 6 plus 1, 7. So now we have an easy way to figure out what the nth term is. So the nth term is going to be equal to a n is equal to, well it seems to be this guy is just our value of n plus some fraction, the bottom is also the value of n, and the top is n plus 1. And there we go. Do a quick check, because it's always a good idea to do a check. So let's check out a1 would be equal to 1 plus 2 over 1. So we get 1 plus 2. That checks out with what we already had as the first term. If we wanted to try another one, like a2 equals 1 plus 2. 2 plus 1 over 1, which would be 1 plus 3 over 1. Whoops, sorry. Not over 1, not over 1. It is divide by n as well. Sorry about the mistake. Divide by 2, 1 plus 3 over 2. Ah, huh, did it on both of them. So it is important to wind up using your formula in the check. So it's also an n here. 2 plus 2 plus 1 over 2. 2 plus 3 over 2. And that does check out with what we had here. Great. Last example, find the nth term for the sequence below. Assume the sequence starts at n equals 1. So we see right from the bat, this thing kind of changes its format a fair bit in these two, right? It's totally different in these two. So before we even really start looking for patterns, we want to get everybody into the same format. because That'll just make it easier to see patterns. So how can we get them in the same format? We first certainly need to have them as fractions. So as fractions, we've got 1. We can always divide by 1, so 1 over 1 then 3 over 1, and then 3 squared over 2, 3 cubed over 6, 3 to the 4th over 24, 3 to the 5th over 120. First thing we're probably noticing is, hey, we've got 3 to the 5th, 3 to the 4th, 3 cubed, 3 squared, 3, well, we could write this as 3 to the 1. How can we write 1 out? Well, remember, 3 to the 0 equals 1. Any number raised to the 0 comes out to be 1. So we could rewrite the top as, 3 to the 0 over 1, 3 to the 1 over 1, 3 squared over, whoops, 2, 3 cubed over 6, 3 to the 4th over 24, 3 to the 5th over 120, and so on. So at the top part, we now see pretty clearly there is a pattern, right? It's the number increases by 1 each time for the exponent on the 3. It starts at 0, so it'll be 3 to the n minus 1. But what about this bottom part, right? 
one twenty, twenty four, six, two, and then we got one and one here. So one, one, two, six, twenty four, one twenty. Well, if we work backwards, we might realize two, six, twenty four, one twenty. You might recognize, oh yeah, factorials. Remember we talked about factorials earlier in the lesson. That looks like factorials. So 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 120. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, that's 24. So we have 5 factorial on the far right. So we can write this as 3 to the 5th over 5 factorial. And we'll keep going. So let's work backwards. 3 to the 4th over 4 factorial. 3 cubed over 3 factorial. 3 squared over 2 factorial. 3 to the 1 over 1 factorial would just get us 1. And here's the most confusing part of all. 3 to the 0 over, well, what can we do that will wind up having factorials involved and still get us 1? Now we have to go back and remember there's a very specific thing about factorials. The way factorials work is 0 factorial is just defined to equal 1. So that means we could also write this as 0 factorial. So we've maintained a pattern, right? We're going to wind up seeing patterns because all these problems are going to be based on patterns. So we know that a factorial pattern, it's no surprise it's going to keep going. So we've got on the bottom 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial. On the top 3 to the 0, 3 to the 1, 3 to the 2, 3 to the 3, 3 to the 4, 3 to the 5. So let's compare that to the numbers n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 6, right? Our first location, our second location, third location, etc. So with that in mind, we see that the top number the top exponent, I should say. The top exponent is always equal to the value of the location, right? At n equals 5, we get a 4 exponent. So it's always minus 1. Similarly, the 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial, it's always that number, it's always the number of the location minus 1 to get to the number in the factorial, right? In the third location at n equals 3, it's a 2 factorial, 3 minus 1. In the sixth location, it's a 5 factorial, 6 minus 1. So we see that they're both based off of this n minus 1 business. So that means we can finally set our a n equals its 3 to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 quantity factorial. And there's our answer. There is the general term. And it's always, always a good idea to check your work with this sort of thing. So let's just do a quick check to make sure that this winds up coming out. So at a1, we would have 3 to the 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1 factorial. So that's 3 to the 0 over 0 factorial. So we get 1 over 1, which equals 1, which checks out with what we initially had. Let's try jumping forward to a slightly larger number so we can check against something else. So at a4, we would be at 3 to the 4 minus 1 over 4 minus 1 factorial. So we have 3 to the 3 over 3 factorial. Everything is in this 3 to the 3, so we don't have to simplify that to 27. We can just leave it as it is. 3 to 3, 3 factorial comes out to be 3 times 2 times 1, or 6. So 3 to the 3 over 6 is what we have for our fourth location. 1, 2, 3, fourth location, 3 to the 3 over 6. So that winds up checking out. We wind up seeing, yay, our general term makes sense. All right, so we've got a really good understanding of how sequences work, how we can get general terms, nth term formulas from looking at them for a while. Recognizing patterns is a really useful skill. It'll show up in a whole bunch of different things in math. So even if you wind up thinking that this is a little bit difficult now, trust me, it's going to wind up paying dividends down the road. You're going to wind up using this stuff a lot, finding patterns in a variety of stuff, whether it's in science class, whether it's in math class, economics, whatever you wind up studying, you're going to wind up having to find patterns of some sort. Even in English, patterns are really important things. Things, right? If we're going to talk about themes in a book. So patterns really matter. So this sort of stuff, really important. We've got a good understanding for sequences. Now we're ready for the rest of this section. We'll have a whole bunch of ideas working from this base of sequences. All right. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.